currently, we are in a discussion series called Who Are We? And really, this, this whole series is about us uh, conveying to the world and, and really laying it out who we are. But I would also say, uh, in large part, who we want to be as an organization, as a church. And uh, it's been a really, really great discussion around uh, what a church can look like and should look like. And, and we've talked about through the whole thing, our, uh, our organizational purpose, kind of what we do as a church. And uh, Downtown Faith exists to help people follow Jesus into a new life of worship, commitment, love, and generosity by creating space to discuss life and faith. This is who we are. This is our mission, our vision, our values. And we feel like done well that this kind of mission and vision values as, as an organization that we can really have an impact on the revitalization of downtown, that we can really have an impact on people, and that we could, could, could be an influencer in this community that we can see life change. And, and so we've really focused in, starting last week, on our values of worship, commitment, love, and generosity. And we said that values are important because organizational values guide the perspective of the organization as well as its actions, defines its culture and beliefs, and when members subscribe to them, the organization appears united when addressing various issues. So it's really important to have these values that are core to who we are. I mean, as you experience various organizations, maybe companies like, like Disney or Apple or Google or even Zappos right down the road, there's this culture, right? There's this thing that they believe about their business and that they believe about people and their impact, and, and you can feel that when you, when you are in their presence, when you're in their sphere, when you're in their influence, you understand what it's like. I mean, we got any Disney fans in here? I love going to Disney. I love the things they produce because you know you're going to get the highest quality customer service and experience. And it's the same thing as a church. We don't want to be any different. We want to have these values that when people are around us as an organization or even as individuals, that they feel these things like worship and commitment and love and generosity. We feel like if a church does this well, it can really change its community. And so last week we looked at our first one, and we said that wholehearted worship is daily reflecting the glory of God through sacrificial living. Daily reflecting the glory of God through sacrificial living. And, and we talked about a lot of people think maybe they don't worship. But we kind of narrowed it down that all of us are worshiping because worship is simply the extravagant respect or adoration for or devotion to something, uh, some kind of object of esteem, something greater than yourself. And we understand that we all tend to worship something starts at birth and it ends at death and it continues through our life. And so our worship, if properly directed to God, helps us find meaning and purpose in life. And it's truly the way to worship God. And we looked at, at this verse here, uh, the Apostle Paul, who was a, a church planner. He went around and he started churches in various major cities. And in Rome, he actually didn't start this church, but the, the church was, was growing so much he wanted to send a letter to them, and he wrote to them. And uh, he's writing about all that God has done and encouraging them. And then he comes to what we consider chapter 12, verse 1. He says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind you will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. So worship isn't just singing. Worship isn't, isn't just coming and showing up to church. Worship is this daily reflecting uh, to God of who he is. And we said in our, our big idea and what we discussed last week is the path to wholehearted worship begins and ends with self-sacrifice, which is one of the most difficult things that we can imagine doing is sacrificing our own desires for, for someone else. And God doesn't want us to die for him. He wants us to live for him. And that is truly the way to worship him. So this week, we're going to look at our next core value, courageous commitment, which is fully devoting ourselves to next steps of faith. I believe that every person on earth has a next step of faith. That every person in this room, including myself, has a next step of faith. And we, we say that it takes courage because courage is the decision that fear doesn't get to make the decisions. And in, in our life, we think about the decisions that we make day in and day out. How much of it involves a fear of rejection or a fear of what someone might think or some other kind of fear in our life? Fear is a decision maker. And courage says that's the decision that fear doesn't get to make the decisions here. It's not an absence of fear. Fear is present. 
but I'm going to have courage. And taking commitment in a culture where commitment isn't necessarily honored or, or well-respected can be very, very difficult. And so I want to look, actually, we're going to look at the next verse, and Paul continues to talk about this uh, right after we see what he talks about worship. We see in his letter to the Romans, he says, don't copy, or some translations say conform to, the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you. One is on the outside, one is on the inside, into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God, or excuse me, then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. A lot of times people want to know, how do I, how do I get there, right? Like, how do I get to a life of faith? How do I get to where I'm trusting this thing that I don't see with my life and with my decisions? How do I get there? And it's much like uh, Doctor Strange. But anyone see the movie Doctor Strange? Yeah, it was an excellent one. I, I loved it. It had a lot of spiritual uh, spiritual lessons for us. But you know, Stephen Strange is, is there. He's in the monastery and he's trying to learn these spiritual practices, and he can't really do it. And he asks the the ancient one, right, the the leader of the monastery. He says, "How do I get from here to there? How do I get from where I am to where you are spiritually?" And she said, "Well, how did you become a doctor?" He said, well, study and practice, lots of it. There's your answer, right? There's your answer, study and practice. There's there's an, an, an attitude of learning and a posture of learning that happens if we really want to transform spiritually, if we really want to live a life of faith. It doesn't come without study and practice. Like it says here, then you will learn to know God's will for you. If you want to know that next step, it requires study and practice. A lot of us probably don't love study and practice. We think of school, right, when it comes to study, or we think of sports when it comes to practice. And it's like at some point you feel like Allen Iverson, practice? i got to practice again? And it's like, yeah. Study and practice is how we get from here to there. It's how we know our next steps of faith is through study and practice, changing the way we think. And our idea that I want to discuss today, which I think is so important, is that countercultural courage moves us towards transformational thinking. And when I say countercultural courage, it's, it's the idea that I'm not going to copy or conform to the world that I live in, the way of thinking that maybe I have been raised with, the way of thinking that my friends and, 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 and uh, maybe the, the college I went to or whatever, the, the, the way the world thinks. You want to know how the world thinks, right? Just go on social media. And people get real brave about what they think on social media as they look at a screen and they type things in. And we see the way people think, and maybe sometimes we're like, yeah, I think like that too. And then other times we're like, oh, that's really weird that they think that way. And, 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 and there's this, the way the world thinks, maybe your society, maybe your, your, your subculture thinks differently about things than another one. And ultimately what we see is that when we are willing to be countercultural, and it is countercultural to follow Jesus, we begin to think differently and we begin to transform from the inside out. We begin to let God transform the way we think when we are brave enough to say, I'm not going to go with the current. I'm going to go against the current. I'm going to try and study and practice and learn something new, a new way of thinking. And I, and I thought to myself, sometimes it's, it's really easy for a pastor to stand up here and say that, right? And, and I get, you know, pastor points and everyone looks kind of confused or nods their head or goes, yeah, that sounds good. But then practically, we, we miss it, right? Have you ever sat there and you, you heard a guy say something, maybe in a TED talk or at some kind of speech, commencement speech in college, and you're like, yeah, that sounds great. But then how does that work practically? Well, I don't want to leave you hanging, right? So I want to actually talk about the difference between culturally conforming and spiritually transforming. I just want to give you a few illustrations of what that could look like to help you know, oh, okay, so in my life, it could look like this. And I could take this next step in this way. Because when we talk about spiritually transforming, sometimes that just goes way over our head. But it's actually very, very practical. So, First off, face value versus faith value. When we talk about face value, it, it's the idea of like optimists, pessimists, and realists look at what's in front of them, and they, and they make a decision based on face value. But there's actually another way of looking at what's in front of you. And I call that hopeful. There's optimists, pessimists, realists, but then there's the hopeful. 
And that's what Jesus really brought. And we talk about the church should bring to a community is hope. Is the idea that, yeah, this is the way things are. But I am hoping that through living differently, through thinking differently, through treating my neighbor differently, that, that actually things can be better. It's not face value where I, I, you know, a, an optimist looks at what it is and pretty much ignores it and just decides to think positive. A pessimist looks at it and, and just automatically thinks negative. And a realist just looks at it, right, and is maybe indifferent to it. Hopeful says, no, 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 I can make change. It, in practical terms, this is what it's like when we started this church. There was a lot of people in church world that, that do the church starting thing. They call it planting and when they looked at what we wanted to do, they went, no, nah, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. On paper, it's not going to work. And that was face value, right? And so what I had to do, what we had to encourage each other as a team to do, is to say, no, 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 we have hope that what we're going to do will work and will lead people towards meaningful life change. We have hope that what we're going to do matters when we help people follow Jesus into a new life. There's face value, and then there's faith value. Something that I don't know. I'm uncertain, but I'm going to embrace it, and we're going to move forward anyways and take next steps. Next, love friends, love enemies, right? People love to love your neighbor and, and the idea of loving your friends when Jesus talks about that. But one of the things that Jesus talked about that you don't hear a whole lot about is love your enemies. This was the message that set him apart. It's pretty easy to love people who think like you, who maybe look like you, or part of your subculture. It's really hard to love your enemies, and as he continued to pray for those who persecute you. Who are those people? Who is that group? Who is that person that you feel has set themselves against you? Practically, loving them, that's countercultural, and that leads to transformational thinking. Oh, I'm not just going to love these people. I'm going to love these people and that person who set themselves up against me or, or my family or my community. I'm going to love both. I, I say this way, Jesus loved the oppressed and the oppressor. This is what set him apart. This is what made Jesus different. This is what made his message and his life different. And it's what makes us as a church and as individuals different when we can love not just those who we agree with, but those whom we disagree with as well. That is transformational. That leads to a different kind of life. Love your friends, but also love your enemies. That's difficult. Also, we have I control versus God controls. I control versus God control, right? Again, this is a practical thing when it comes to following Jesus, when it comes to transformational thinking, is my mind shifts from I can control this situation, I can control this person, I can control this relationship, to no, God is actually the one that's in control, and I'm going to trust him with this. To give you illustration, and again, sometimes illustrations I can only pull from my life, and by no means am I saying this, that I have this done perfectly, but I, I think back to when I was our first year of marriage. So my wife and I got married in West Virginia. We drove across the country to Las Vegas. I was starting an internship, unpaid, and she didn't have a job. So we moved into an apartment they probably shouldn't have let us into, and we had a little bit of money from when we got married. People gave us money, and whatever fit in our Honda Fit, which is not very big, I barely fit, um, and uh, we drove across the country, and that's what we had. We slept on an air mattress and, had, and sat on the floor to eat dinner. That was our life when we first moved here. And a few months went by, and no jobs were coming for her, and we were running out of money. And someone sat me down and told me, said, Jeremy, you're a husband now. You've got to take care of your wife. And again, the cultural thinking is, as a man, you have to provide. This is what you need to go out, and you need to get a job. I was like, but I really think God wants me to actually just continue doing what I'm doing and, and, and trust him that he's going to provide for us. I think I'm going to go. And it's like, nope, this is what you need to do. So I, I was somebody older than me, wiser than me, been married longer than me. I thought, well, I should probably take that advice. And came home and told my wife, I said, hey, tomorrow I'm going to go out and look for a job too. Um, I know you've been, you've been out there doing that and nothing's come up. Uh, as a man, I'm told it's my responsibility to do this, so I'm going to go do it. The next morning, I was taking a shower, and I was literally doubled over in pain in my stomach, just gnawing at me, feeling absolutely not. 
You absolutely cannot try and take control of the situation in which God is in control. And so I, I called Martha and I said, hey, I, I just really feel I cannot go do that. If I go do this, I'm actually wrong in trying to go force this and take control and make this happen. She said, okay, I, I'll trust you. It was still early in our marriage. And she was like, I'll trust you. Like, she, she got a job, and the last day that we could pay our rent without taking any, you know, uh, uh, extra fees or anything like that, she made her first paycheck, and we paid, and we never missed after that. And I look at that, and I go, you know what, that's, that's different kind of thinking. When people talk about faith, it's not this abstract, obscure thing. It's saying, no, I'm going to trust God because I think this is what I need to do. And practically, God came through for us. And he's come through for us year after year after year. And we continue to do that. Why? Because slowly but surely, my mind is being transformed by God. And I'm, I'm thinking differently instead of thinking like this world. And lastly, live for me versus live for God and others. If we get this thinking, somehow we're all connected which is what the Bible talks about, is that we all came from this one, this source of life, and that all of us are image bearers of God. And when we realize that we're all connected, it shifts the way we think from going from, I got to look out for number one, I got to think about what I need, I got to think about what I want, I've got to think about what I'm going to do in life, to, no, I'm going to think about God, and I'm going to consider others as well. At one point, Paul tells his follower, or tells the followers of Jesus to consider uh, others just like they consider themselves. It's like, okay, what am I going to eat? Okay, my neighbor, he needs something to eat as well. Okay, this is, this is my life trajectory. I'm going to look across the table and go, okay, what, what can I help you? How can I help you in your life trajectory as well? Imagine a people that lived like that. Right? This transformational thinking. The, the world says, our systems say, look out for number one. And Jesus says, no, no, no. I want you to love your neighbor. I want you to love your enemy. I want you to pray for those who persecute you. I want you to live for God, for the glory of God and the good of others. And not just yourself. That's transformational thinking. If we realize we're all connected, it changes the way we view everything. If we realize we all came from God, we want to live for God, and we want to live for others. And so our idea worth discussing is countercultural courage moves us towards transformational thinking. I think I would define courageous commitment as uh, committing to something fearlessly. Uh, within everything that I do in life, uh, you have to be very bold. It takes a lot of faith uh, when you talk about believing in God and doing uh, what you feel is right. Courageous commitment, you know, is the foundation of it. Like we believe in something that most people can't feel, they can't see, they can't relate. But I feel that if you have some type of courageous commitment, it is very key and essential to having the faith and committing to something and believing in something that can change your life. With me being worth the weight guy, and uh, waiting for God, it's everything that courageous commitment has to deal with. I'm committing to something every single day that I am practicing celibacy, that I am abstaining from something that I feel is very honorable and has everything to do with my relationship with God. So with me, from the time I wake up to the time I go to sleep, it's definitely uh, something where courageous commitment is with me every step of the way and uh, how I live my day-to-day -day life. So why does downtown need a church that commits courageously? I think downtown needs that because it can be the lifeblood of what's really going on down here. Uh, there's a lot of good things. Uh, I mean, you have businesses, you have uh, just people that are moving here. So there's great energy. But I feel that if you could have a church that would commit courageously, 
it would be that place that everybody can go and get the word and we can discuss life and faith as we do here at Downtown Faith. So I feel that we're doing a great job committing to people. We're doing a good job being very bold and stepping out on faith and uh, just letting people know that this is an option, that you can come here and you can be yourself. And that takes guts, you know, that takes a lot of heart and that takes a lot of courage. And I think that's why downtown really needs what's happening right now. So how would I encourage someone to commit courageously and maybe take those next steps uh, to downtown faith? I would say, just do it. And I know that that sounds maybe corny or that sounds uh, very commercial, but I think you have to do just that. You have to give yourself a chance, you know, give God a chance, uh, give downtown faith a chance of what we're actually doing here. Uh, it's not going to be easy, but I think it's, you know, one foot over the next. If you can, you know, wake up one Sunday and just check us out to see what we're doing. You don't have to go all in, you know, you don't have to push all the chips to the table just yet, but you got to put one out there. So then maybe another one can follow and then eventually you can commit courageously to not just what we're doing, but yourself and your relationship with God. And that's the most important thing. We're trying to combine that and help guide you. So if we can do anything to help you get there, that's all that we wanna do. So I think that very first step and most important thing is to just do it, baby. Like you have to do it.